Greetings and salutations and welcome back to Colin's Last Stand right here on YouTube. My name, as always, is Colin Moriarty. I appreciate you being here with me and appreciate you taking time out of your day to enjoy this video, or I hope you enjoy it. It's about a topic very, well, contemporary, but also very historical. But before we get into it, I just wanted to take a moment to talk about two things very briefly with the audience. The first one is something that I think is somewhat obvious. The set's a little different now. Now, the set's going to be in flux over the next few weeks as I figure everything out. I've put out feelers for what I am calling a very part-time, very temporary production consultant that I hope can help me with some of this now that I have the time and the capacity to wrap my head around a lot of other things now that my life has calmed down a little bit. So that's going to be in flux. I'm going to be working on it. I appreciate your patience as everything changes and I hope improves. So keep that feedback coming. I'm reading all of it. And the second thing I wanted to bring up was about Patreon. Uh, usually I tack Patreon kind of promotions at the end of every video, but today I wanted to actually put it up front because I listened to your feedback, I solicited your guys' feedback about Patreon, and the most requested thing that you guys wanted on there was a way to kind of affect change. You wanted a way to affect topics and all of that kind of stuff, so I've instituted a $2 a month Patreon tier, um, and obviously everything above that will have access to it as well, where you can submit a topic a month, and then the entire audience can vote on all of these topics in a primary election. And then we have a general election with five topics. The topic that wins that general election will then have a video dedicated to it in the next month and so on and so forth. So it's a way for you to directly affect what Collins Last Stand creates. And I hope you enjoy it. Your support over there keeps this ad free and independent. And so I really appreciate you. So enough of that. Let's get into the topic. The topic today is the 25th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The 25th Amendment hails from 1967. It's one of the most recent amendments to the Constitution. And it actually is quite contemporary and quite part of the zeitgeist, as it were, because with Donald Trump driving so many people insane, rightfully or otherwise, people are looking, or some people are looking, for some avenues in which he can be removed. Now, the general impeachment kind of thing that we went over in a previous video is probably not going to happen unless he is guilty of some high crime or misdemeanor. And especially in regards to Russia and the collusion, it seems like nothing's really there. So that's not really going to be an option. But a part of the 25th Amendment actually gives the vice president and the cabinet members alongside Congress, the House and the Senate, a remedy by which they could remove the president. And I wanted to go into how that is and, and how that works and how it came to be. And also a little bit of history about how it brought us up to this point, or to that point, I should say, in the 60s, that the Senate and the House at the time thought it was necessary. So let's jump in. The language of the 25th Amendment is quite complex, and it's separated into four sections. And before we get into that, because I want to go into each section and a little bit of history about all of those sections, I want to talk a little bit about when it came about and how it passed. So as you might recall, John F. Kennedy, JFK, was assassinated by Lee Harvey Oswald in Texas in 1963. And Lyndon Johnson, his vice president from Texas, took over and became president. Now this wasn't an unusual happenstance in American history. JFK was the fourth president, the fourth sitting president to be assassinated, and LBJ was the eighth vice president to have taken over at that point in time for a president that was that was killed or had you know died or whatever the case might be. Just for history's sake, it's only happened one time since then. No president has been killed or has died in office since JFK. But as we went over in a previous video, Richard Nixon did resign in office and Gerald Ford took over for him as his vice president, became president. And actually he has the 25th Amendment to thank for how kind of cleanly that all went. The purpose of the 25th Amendment is really clear. It's to kind of fill in holes that the founders left in regards to the vice president, the powers of the vice president, and what happens to the vice presidency if a vice president, you know, ascends to the presidency, whether through resignation, assassination, death, incapacitation, whatever the case might be. What happens to the vice president? What are the roles of the vice president? What happens to the vice presidency thereafter? All that's covered. But there's actually something much more interesting in the 25th Amendment buried in there too, which is how can the vice president work with the cabinet and Congress, like I said, to remove the sitting president? And so let's go into this point by point and we'll get, we'll get all of this illustrated for you so you have a better understanding by the end of this video. So when LBJ took over for JFK following JFK's you know, tragic assassination in 63, there was some question and some concern, not only about LBJ himself, but about the vacancy of the vice presidency, how that might be filled, and then by kind of the people around him and who was kind of next in the line of succession and this was actually illustrated very vividly on television and for the entire world to see when LBJ went to the House of Representatives to speak to a combined House and Senate kind of meeting for the first time as president. And people kind of saw for the first time, like, this situation doesn't look very good. Now, what do I mean by that? 
Well, LBJ is sitting up there famously flanked by the Speaker of the House of Representatives, a man named John McCormick, and the President Pro Tempore of the Senate, a man from Arizona named Carl Hayden, who was in Congress forever. But here's the rub. Hayden was 88 years old, and McCormick was 71. And LBJ, while at 54, was no spring chicken himself. In fact, he had just had a heart attack and survived a heart attack a few years prior to that. So people saw this picture and realized suddenly, like, wow, LBJ is there. He's not a well man. In fact, he dies 10 years later after he takes presidency. He's not president at that time, but he dies in 1973. The Speaker of the House and the President Pro Tempore are both well in excess of normal age to even be in those chambers, even though there's a lot of old people in there still to this day. You understand what I'm saying. They should probably be retired and enjoying themselves. They're probably fucking losing their minds as well. And there's no mechanism by which LBJ could easily fill that vice presidential role. And these problems go back a long way indeed, starting in 1841, when William Henry Harrison, the ninth president of the United States, dies 30 days into office, and John Tyler becomes president. Or so everyone thinks, and so John Tyler assumes, but there are some constitutional questions. It's amazing to think about it, but we got through George Washington's two terms, John Adams one term, Thomas Jefferson's two terms, James Madison's two terms, James Monroe's two terms, John Quincy Adams' one term, Andrew Jackson's two terms, and Martin Van Buren's term before we ever had to deal with the issue of some sort of succession, of something happening to a president while he was in office. And William Henry Harrison, Tippecanoe as he was widely known from his exploits in the military, became president, gave this ridiculously long inaugural address in the cold rain, and then died of illnesses related to being in that cold for hours. So John Tyler, the Tippecanoe and Tyler II kind of slogan that they had, well, that was John Tyler. John Tyler becomes president. And there was immediately questions based on the constitution at the time of whether John Tyler was actually president because there was some ambiguous language in the constitution that indicated that might not be the case. Specifically, article two, section one of the constitution says, quote, in case of the removal of the president from office or of his death, resignation, or inability to discharge the powers and duties of the said office, the same shall devolve on the vice president, end quote. The problem here is it doesn't make clear if the vice president becomes the president or if the vice president simply has the president's duties. And this was something that John Tyler and company had to figure out. John Tyler insisted and set a precedent for future generations that he was the president. He let his cabinet know that he was the president. People would insult him and call him his accidency or acting president or vice president as president, all these terms. He even refused to open his mail as president unless it was addressed to President John Tyler. If it was addressed to acting president or vice president, he would kick it back to those people without ever having opened it and read it. And a lot of people had a problem with this. John Tyler was wildly unpopular with lots of different people and he didn't even run for office in his own right. In fact, John Tyler served in the Confederacy a little bit later, but we'll leave that here. That's neither here nor there. But the fact remains that John Tyler set a precedent that others would have to follow later on because, well, he made it very clear. He reads the Constitution and others at the time saying that he's not acting president. He's not vice president as president. He's not the vice president dispensing the role of president. He is president. But this left a gap in the vice presidency. And there's no ambiguous language in the, in the Constitution about what you do there. No one had any fucking idea what you're supposed to do in, in terms of getting a vice president into that role. So when presidents would die and vice presidents would ascend to that role, there would be no vice president. So John Tyler served with no vice president. Just a few years later, when Zachary Taylor died in 1850 of some gastrointestinal issues, Millard Fillmore became president and he too had no vice president. In fact, this kind of goes on and on and on. Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in 1865. Andrew Johnson takes over. He has no vice president. And that's actually a really calamitous situation because Andrew Johnson was one vote in the Senate away from being removed. In which case, I guess the Speaker of the House became president, but that might have looked a little shady since the Speaker of the House was in on the removal or at least voting for the terms of impeachment that went to the Senate. He was in on the removal. So you needed a buffer there. And things were starting to get a little strange indeed when you look at all these different situations. James Garfield in 1881 is shot by an assassin. Chester Arthur takes over. Chester Arthur has no vice president. And you have other assassinations and other 
kind of incapacitations. Warren Harding dies in office in 1923. FDR dies in office in 1945 during his fourth term and Harry Truman takes over. Calvin Coolidge, by the way, takes over for Harding. William McKinley is killed in 1901 and Teddy Roosevelt takes over. And then you have JFK and LBJ. So you have these eight situations and it wasn't until the eighth situation that occurred that everyone's like, we need to remedy this. Look at all these old bastards, these people that no one in the nation voted for, just people in these states or in these districts that are in the line of succession. We need to do something about this. We need a way for the vice president to become president and then fill that role. And that's part of what Amendment 25 does. Section one of Amendment 25 says, in case of the removal of the president from office or of his death or resignation, the vice president shall become president. So this goes back to the problem that John Tyler originally confronted in 1841 and answers it once and for all. Whether in hindsight or otherwise, John Tyler's instincts were right. He was president. And my assumption is that that's what the founders had intended, but the language was a little loose. Section two says, quote, whenever there is a vacancy in the office of the vice president, the president shall nominate a vice president who shall take office upon confirmation by a majority vote of both houses of Congress, end quote. So this finally solves the problem that, you know, Millard Fillmore found himself in, John Tyler found himself in, Chester Arthur found himself in, Andrew Johnson found himself in. What do you do? There is no vice president. Well, this gives them a mechanism by which there will be a vice president. The, the president, dies or resigns or is removed from somehow from office, his vice president becomes president. That president, who used to be vice president, now nominates his own choice for vice president, which the House and the Senate vote on. And all you need is a majority vote. So 50 plus one in the Senate, 51 in the Senate, and then you need just half plus one, 50% plus one in the House. So a pretty simple majority vote to fill that role. And suddenly the line of succession starts to make a lot more sense. Now, the whole presidential succession thing is another matter entirely. This was actually dealt with three different times. One, almost immediately upon the Union being founded in 1792, they dealt with succession. They dealt with it again in 1886, and then they dealt with it again in 1947. So there is this line of succession. It's just that the vice president's supposed to be in there somewhere, and now he's, fi he's fulfilling his role as basically second in command. Thanks to Amendment 25, there will never be a massive gap like there were, a years-long gap like there was, back in the day. And in case you're curious about what the line of succession is, it goes like this. President, Vice President, Speaker of the House, President Pro Tempore of the Senate, Secretary of State, Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of Defense, the Attorney General, Secretary of the Interior, Secretary of Agriculture, Secretary of Commerce, Secretary of Labor, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Secretary of Transportation, Secretary of Energy, Secretary of Education, Secretary of Veteran Affairs, and then finally the Secretary of Homeland Security. And you might notice that order of those, those cabinet positions is very uh, intentional. The line of succession notes that the oldest cabinet positions go first and the newest cabinet positions go last. So you can see that Homeland Security being the most recent cabinet level position and, and department at the executive level is last in the line of succession. And you'll also note that that's why cabinet members typically in massive you know, uh, speeches and whatnot never appear together in case there's a bombing, say at the Congress during the State of the Union, the last remaining person, say the Secretary of Agriculture or whatever will become president if everyone else dies. So that gives you a little bit of input and insight. And yes, I did use in these pictures Trump's cabinet to give you a little idea just in reality of how it would all go down. But when you get to sections three and four of the 25th Amendment, things get way more verbose and way more complicated. And they stop dealing so much with the vice president, his role, his powers, the ability to appoint the vice president. And they get way more into something much more random, which is how can you remove a president? Now, we already have mechanisms for this, for the removal of a president. There are really only four ways that a president is no longer president. He or she loses an election or terms out, basically, in other words, just kind of it's over for that person, whether or not they do one term or two terms or back in the day with FDR four terms, but it's over eventually for that person. They resign the office, which has only happened once with Richard Nixon. They die in office, which has happened eight different times, four assassinations and four natural deaths. Or now there's a 25th Amendment remedy, which is that the vice president and a plurality of the cabinet members, so half plus one of the sitting cabinet members, along with the vice president, lets the House and the Senate know that the president is unable to fulfill his role. And so let's get into what the language of it says. Section three says, quote, whenever the president transmits to the president pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives his written declaration that he is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office, and until he transmits to them a written declaration to the contrary, such powers and duties shall be discharged by the vice president as acting president. Now, this is an important note to make here before I get into the real nitty gritty of section four. 
acting president was a term that is not enshrined in the Constitution and is only really being used as of John Tyler's presidency. Is he an acting president or is he a real president? Well, again, we understand that John Tyler made himself a real president, not an acting president. This constitutional amendment enshrines in the Constitution the term acting president. Suddenly there's something that we've actually never had for an elongated period of time before, which is someone that is not president, not vice president, but is acting as president until X, Y, and Z occurs. Suddenly that's an official thing. And section three of amendment 25 lets the president let the Senate and the House know that he is unable to fulfill his duties for whatever reason. And then the vice president, his or her vice president becomes acting president. But things get really weird when you go into section four. Section four is long. It says the following quote, whenever the vice president and a majority of either the principal officers of the executive departments or of such other body as Congress may by law provide, transmit to the president pro tempore of the Senate and the speaker of the House of Representatives, their written declaration that the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office. The vice president shall immediately assume the powers and duties of the office as acting president. Thereafter, when the president transmits to the president pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives his written declaration that no inability exists, he shall resume the powers and duties of his office unless the vice president and a majority of either the principal officers of the executive department or of such other body as Congress may by law provide, transmit within four days to the president pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives their written declaration that the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office. Thereupon, Congress shall decide the issue, assembling within 48 hours for that purpose, if not in session. If the Congress within 21 days after receipt of the latter written declaration, or if Congress is not in session within 21 days after Congress is required to assemble, determines by two-thirds vote of both houses that the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office, the vice president shall continue to discharge the same as acting president. Otherwise, the president shall resume the powers and duties of his office. End quote. Good Lord, that's long. But here's basically what it says. What it basically says, again, is if the vice president, along with the cabinet members, more than half of the cabinet members, let the Senate and the House know that they think for some reason the president is unable to be president, the mechanism is set into play where the vice president becomes acting president. Now, the president can then write a letter or otherwise inform the House and the Senate that none of that is true, in which case everything is reversed and he becomes president again. But the case isn't dropped here. The vice president and those aforementioned cabinet members can then let the House and the Senate know that they do not agree that there's something amiss here, in which case the House and the Senate get together and they deliberate over a certain amount of time as illustrated in the amendment, and then they vote. The threshold for the vote is high, two thirds, which is the same in the Senate to impeach and remove a president. A simple majority in the House actually brings articles of impeachment, but the Senate must vote two thirds in the, in the affirmative to remove a president. Well, the, our, Amendment 25's actually barrier is way higher. Both the House and the Senate have to have two-third votes. So not a simple majority and then a two-thirds vote, but two two-thirds votes have to be rendered in order for the president to be removed from his office through the 25th Amendment. And then again, still, the vice president doesn't become president per se. He becomes acting president. Again, a new term that's somewhat nebulous. I don't really have any clue what that means. We've never actually had a challenge this where we have someone kind of just taking over the office, but kind of just being the, the caretaker, the regent as it were. So ironically, the 25th Amendment answers some long-standing questions going back to the 9th Presidential Administration, yet it also opens up all of these questions that we have to ask now, like what is an acting president? Note that the language says that Congress can pass laws that would extend the amendment to reach far beyond if they wanted to, just the Congress, just the cabinet, just the VP. It says that Congress can make laws that basically uh, prescribe the remedies by which this amendment would go into play, specifically with the third and the fourth sections. And a lot of people look at this amendment, specifically what it has to do looking backwards in terms of like, well, the, the what could have been kind of like, well, how could have this all have gone down differently if the amendment had existed earlier? And there's some interesting stories to that effect. Franklin Pierce, for instance, who was president for a time during the 1850s, lost his son right before he became president and was apparently completely morose, completely depressed, heavily reliant on alcohol, probably not the man fit for the office on the eve of the Civil War. And so some people look at Franklin Pierce as really being the first president that in hindsight maybe should have been removed from office with some sort of 25th Amendment-like operation. Woodrow Wilson in the late 19-teens, late in his second term, had a stroke. And actually a lot of people were complicit in hiding it. He was absolutely positively not able to be president. So that's one issue that people look back upon and are like, well, an Amendment 25 kind of remedy would have been nice 
to have at that point as well. Calvin Coolidge's son died when he was in office, and apparently he was depressed, despondent, totally uninterested in, in, in his duties, maybe even a little bit derelict in terms of taking care of his duties, and was apparently so disinterested in even running again for president that he barely tried to run, he barely tried to get any votes, he still won anyway. And so he might have been another man that might have been removed if the amendment had existed earlier. Dwight Eisenhower straight up had a heart attack in 1955 late in his first term. Richard Nixon would have become president if Eisenhower had died, but still there was no mechanism by which he could have let Nixon act as president. And Eisenhower, to his credit, was such a G and so well respected by so many people that he was reelected a year after he had a heart attack. Some people say LBJ himself was super paranoid and super unable to kind of dispense with the duties of the presidency, specifically having to do with Vietnam and just a lot of paranoia, a lot of issues, a lot of mental issues he had. So maybe another candidate. Richard Nixon apparently suffered from some alcoholism uh, late in his tenure. Maybe he should have been removed. And actually the only time the 25th Amendment's third and fourth section, specifically the fourth section, were enacted or at least thought about in an open manner in an administration was actually during the second term of Ronald Reagan in 1987 when his own chief of staff and some close aides and friends and confidants around him really started to question his mental health and they talked openly amongst themselves on if they should really start to ena enact that mechanism in the in the 25th amendment to have uh, at the time George H.W. Bush take over for him as acting president. This of course went nowhere but they were on to something because it was only four years after Reagan left office that he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and in hindsight a lot of people saw the early onset of that terrible disease taking Ronald Reagan's mind. Remember, he was very old for the, for presidency, even at the time, but just old generally. So not a huge surprise. So actually the amendment was almost enacted during his tenure. But when it's talked about in terms of, you know, using the 25th Amendment to remove Donald Trump, there are multiple problems with this. Some I think people think about openly and some I think people just ignore or don't think about. And I think that they're all reasonable to bring up. My personal take is that Donald Trump is not going to be removed by the 25th Amendment and no president is going to be removed from the 25th Amendment unless they are literally physically incapacitated like a stroke or something like that. They cannot possibly respond and the Senate and the House and cabinet members and everyone act in unison to take care of that problem. The mental kind of issues that people kind of think that Donald Trump might have are harder to prove and so I think that that's one major barrier to enacting the 25th Amendment in regards to Donald Trump is that you're not looking at him, at him and saying like, well, the man had a heart attack, the man had a stroke, the man has just lost his marbles in some demonstrable way. So I just don't think it's going to be used for that reason just generally anyway. Another major issue is that it, it's looked at in my mind and I think to a lot of people, a lot of scholars' minds as being a, as kind of being an avenue for a possible coup. Since the vice president has everything to gain by becoming acting president, but he's not literally president according to the language, which is going to cause an enormous amount of problems in and of itself, it can be looked at as saying like, well, the vice president is using his power in some way, in some untoward way to ascend. And so you have to be kind of questionable about that. That's why I think the 25th Amendment is somewhat imperfect in that it involves the vice president at all. If the vice president is going to ascend to the presidency in some way, even in an acting fashion, he probably should be removed from any sort of action that occurs around that possibility. Of course, going into this as well, and why I think it's just unlikely, is that the vice president, not always, but typically, and at least sometimes, is quite loyal to the president. After all, the vice president ascends because of the president to that position. And the same goes with all the cabinet level appointees who are not elected to those positions, but are placed into those positions with advice and consent from Congress, but are placed into those positions by the president. So there's a loyalty factor here as well. Are all of these people going to turn on the man or woman that put them in that position? It's unlikely unless they have a guarantee. But again, this then goes to the House and the Senate with two third votes threshold. It's a very difficult thing to imagine ever happening. And in this specific instance with, with Trump, with his cabinet, with his vice president, who seems very loyal to him, plus a GOP House and a GOP Senate, it just doesn't seem like a likely avenue. And then I think going back to what I was saying before about like the kind of the coup mentality, I don't think the voters are going to be very thrilled about having a president removed like that if the reasons aren't very obvious and kind of unanimously accepted. Again, something, a physical ailment. The man's in a coma. The man had a stroke and can't talk. All of those kinds of things. That's different. But again, pointing at Donald Trump and being like, he's crazy, mm, harder to do. And could that cause some sort of major social, civil back, uh, backlash, some, some unrest, some violence? I think it's possible, if not likely, that that would happen. And so... I think you have to be very careful. Similar to my argument about the whole impeachment thing to begin with, if you're going to relitigate the election through these processes that don't exist in order to relitigate elections, then you're probably going to reap the whirlwind. And so you have to be very, very careful with that. 
Nonetheless, I hope you enjoyed my episode on the 25th Amendment. I hope you learned something. I hope you have walked away with something. And I hope you just enjoyed yourself thoroughly since I'm occupying quite a bit of your time with this video. As usual, I encourage you to thumb up the video if you liked it and thumb it down if you didn't. I hope you choose to share it with your friends and family. Subscribe here on YouTube. Spread the word of Colin's Last Stand. I'm working really hard on it and I really am so glad that so many of you are out there enjoying it. But let me know in the comments what you like and what you don't like. I'm always reading everything. You'll find me in the comments. I answer tons of people's uh, comments, whether they're nice or not. Hopefully they're nice. Keep them nice. Let's keep it civil. A lot of people have been noting how civil this community is. And of course, speaking of civil communities, I hope you join us on places like Reddit. Uh, there's a fan run Facebook group and an official Facebook group that you can check out. Um, I'm on Twitter, etc. and so on. Obviously I mentioned Patreon early on, so you know that exists. Really, I do appreciate all of your support and the time that you dedicate to this, to Colin's Last Stand. Keep the feedback coming. Be good to each other out there. Let's talk in the comments below. And of course, as I always leave you with the term, see you right back there. Keep on learning.